Amen, man. I was scared that we were going to sing happy birthday to Tony's son, too. I said, man, I start getting anxious when I'm preaching, you know. I, everybody that's up here can see me look at him like, man, come on, keep the, let me get up there. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like a horse sitting in the, in the stall ready to get out on that racetrack. You know what I mean? I just, when I know I'm preaching, I get excited about it, especially today, especially whenever... Like Helen, when she was up here, I was like, man, she, she's already started my sermon. You know what I mean? Like, stop. Let me preach, you know? But it's important to make, make sure that Jesus Christ is everything in your life. And, and I've been thinking about this, about Jesus a lot lately, because I'll just share a little testimony. I, I was... I had a truck. You probably see all that, saw that F-150 outside. I had just gotten that truck. And somebody called me. They're like, hey, can I borrow your truck? And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. I let them borrow my truck to propose to somebody. And I just let them take my truck. I didn't explain anything about the truck. I didn't explain anything about the truck. Well, he calls me a couple hours later. He's on the side of the road, you know. And I just knew immediately he had... He had blown the engine in my truck. I don't have my truck anymore because the engine exploded. But God was showing me, like, and I was angry. I was mad. I was hot. You know what I mean? I'm like, how in the world did this happen? You know what I mean? Like, I'm letting this guy borrow my truck, doing him a favor, and he blows my engine. You know, he accidentally had put it in four-wheel drive low and drove it, and it blew the engine. And I was upset, and then I realized... I can't be upset at anybody but myself. You know what I mean? Because I just put him in this truck, and I didn't explain anything to him. I assumed that he knew how to drive this truck. I assumed that he understood the principles of having a four-wheel drive car. And the Lord has used this situation to teach me that I cannot make any assumptions about anything and that I can't assume that somebody understands what I understand. And as a pastor and as a leader in the church, I can't make any assumptions about where any of us are at. And I can't assume that all of you have the same foundation that I have and the same understanding that I have. So the Lord's been pushing me to get back to that foundation. And that foundation that is laid is in Jesus Christ. And last year, we, we, or not last year, last week, I was sharing about the fear of the Lord. And, and I'm just going to make it a point over these, however, whenever I preach, I want to make sure that I start from the beginning. You know what I mean? Because as, as I get excited, like it's fun when I read the word and when I hear John speak and I receive a revelation, like I want to share that revelation. You know what I mean? I want to share something new. But it's important to start from the beginning. You know what I mean? Because if I'm standing up here sharing these revelations and these things that I'm learning and, and that God's showing me and all these things, you know, based on my foundation, people that don't have the same foundation as me aren't going to be edified like I am. So I have to make sure that I'm laying this foundation in Jesus Christ. And, and I want to do that, and hopefully God will allow me to do that. Because it's important not to make any assumptions about where anybody's at. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that may have never heard the gospel. There's a lot of per people that, that may have not read what Jesus says. And we need to know that Jesus is the one that we got to listen to. That's the foundation <laughs> that we have to build upon. Whatever Jesus said is what we need to hear. And it, it's, it's good to know that, that it's already written down for us. Everything, we have to start with what has been written. I know it's easy to think that you want to hear from God. You know what I mean? Like, God, show me. Where I'm going, show me this, show me that. But God's looking at us and he's saying, why don't you first start with laying the foundation and knowing what I've already spoken? 
And then once you start to live and move and walk in that, then we can talk about these other things. You know what I mean? In Micah verses, chapter 6, verses 8, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So it's important that we know that we have to start here because God's looking at us and he's saying, I've shown you. I've given you everything that you need already. And the fact that you're coming to me and asking me for these other things is based on the foundation and the principle that you don't really know what's already yours. You know what I mean? That you haven't really understood what I've already told you. And I wanted to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. And if we could just stand and read this together, I would appreciate it. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. And this is Moses speaking. He says, he says the Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brothers like me, unto him shall you listen and hearken. According to all that you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I don't die. And the Lord, unsent, Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brothers, like unto you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Amen. You can be seated. So it's important to know that when Moses is speaking to the people of Israel, this is, he's speaking to them, and this is, at, you know, after God had shown up and the mountain was on fire and they saw all this great stuff and God was speaking out of heaven the Ten Commandments, the people of Israel were like, Look, tell God not to speak to us anymore. But if you got something to say, you speak to us. They wanted a mediator. Because God is so great, they were terrified. They were like, we can't hear from God directly. Otherwise, we're going to die. That's how they felt. That's how they felt when they heard God speak. So God said, this is good that they said that. But Moses isn't the guy. I'm going to raise up another person. Like Moses, in the fact that, in the sense that he's going to be a deliverer. He's going to bring the people out of slavery. He's going to be a savior. And he's going to institute the law. Like Moses. But Moses wasn't the one. Moses, everything that he laid out, everything that he taught us, was to lead us to Jesus. The law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. It wasn't the final say. So when everything that Moses said, whenever Jesus came, anything that he said trumped what Moses said. Even though it didn't really contradict. You know what I mean? He actually brought it and set a higher standard. <laughs> you know what I mean? When he came, Moses said, don't murder. Jesus said, don't even call somebody a fool. You know what I mean? Moses said, don't commit adultery. Jesus said, don't even look at a woman lustfully. You know what I'm saying? So he came and he really, he set a higher standard. But at the same time, even though he set the standard higher, he died and made a way for us to live up to that standard. You know what I mean? He died and cleansed us from our sin conscience and purified us from our sin conscience and made us a pure vessel that God could inhabit and to be able to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be able to be born again. And it's important to understand that. It's important to understand that Jesus, when he's speaking, he's speaking God's will. He's speaking and telling us how God is expecting us to live. And I'm not going to I'm going to focus, I mean, because Jesus says so much. I can't obviously sit here and say everything that Jesus said today. But I want to lay a good foundation. 
in making sure that we understand that we are required to live according to what Jesus said. And that he has been given all authority in heaven and earth. And that he spoke the words of the Father. He spoke the words of God. Everything that he spoke is a commandment. And, and I want to just go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. And this kind of, this echoes, you know, Deuteronomy. It says, God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So when we're looking to hear from God, God's saying, look, I sent Jesus. I spoke to you in different times and different ways through these prophets, but now I'm expressly speaking to you through my son, Jesus Christ. You must listen to him. You must listen to what he says. And we have this record, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these all have recorded what Jesus spoke, even though I don't believe it's recorded everything Jesus said. In the end of John, it says, if, if everything that Jesus had said and done was recorded, even the whole world would be filled with the books, couldn't contain the books that would be written. So, but it lays a foundation. You know what I mean? It lays the foundation for us to build upon. And and it's the foundation is built upon the law and the prophets. We trust and we believe everything that we read in the New Testament because we can test it that it lines up with what was written before. You know what I mean? The Old Testament is just foretelling everything that's going to happen, and the New Testament is the fulfillment of those things. It's, it's we see, we trust what Jesus did, what Jesus said, and what the apostles said, because we can see that when we read the Old Testament, we're like, we're left hanging. We're like, because without the New Testament, you'd be waiting. Like, what's going on? Because if Jesus hadn't come, we, would, we wouldn't believe the Old Testament. <laughs> you know what I mean? We wouldn't believe. We'd still be waiting for some Messiah. And actually, we wouldn't be waiting for a Messiah anymore because we would have known that the Messiah would have had to have already come. That's why I always tell people, I'm like, man, I don't understand the Jews. I don't think a Jew could possibly really believe in Judaism. Because if you do, you would have to know that either the Messiah didn't come or he came and you missed it. You know what I mean? Because you should know and be able to test by reading the law that the Messiah had to have already come. You know what I mean? And, and to be a Jew still, I always say, like, you know, a, Jew, a real Jew isn't really a Jew. Otherwise, they'd be a Christian. You know what I mean? Because if you believe this, you would have to come to the conclusion that Jesus fulfilled this. You would have to come to the conclusion that either Jesus fulfilled this or this is untrustworthy and we are of all men most miserable. Because <laughs> we would be like having a God who just gave us life but then just left us. But we don't have a God who just gave us life and then just left us. He created us for a purpose. He created us with a plan. And he fulfilled that plan in Jesus. He fulfilled that plan in Jesus. And Jesus came and showed us, no, look, don't be afraid. God loves you. God loves you. He's telling people, God loves you. He says, don't worry. You know, Jesus is telling us, don't worry about anything. You see the sparrows? You know, he says, God takes care of these sparrows. They don't toil. They don't worry. They don't have savings accounts. They, they don't have Roth IRAs. They don't have none of that. But God takes care of them. And he makes sure that they all survive. 
and not even one of those sparrows falls to the ground, and God doesn't understand or know about it. Jesus says if one of those sparrows falls to the ground and God knows about that, how much more valuable are you to him? He says the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And when, when we hear that, we should start to think, oh my gosh, my hairs are all numbered. We should, we should make sure that we really understand what Jesus is saying. <laughs> we can't just gloss over this stuff because it's so important. It's so important to know how God sees us. It's important to know how he sees us and he loves us. Like it says, we are his children. We are his children. But in order to be his children, we have to be born again. Our natural estate, the way that we're born, is we're born into the lineage of Adam. And that lineage is condemned. The only way to be freed from the lineage of Adam is to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ. Because when Adam came and he sinned, we were all brought into the subject and, subject and captive to sin. And then from then on, because he was our representative. I know it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair that Adam makes this mistake and that we would all be subject to death because of him. But at the end of the day, it really that's a foolish thing to get caught up on because you're really thinking that you would have done differently than Adam. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like let's, just get it, let's just get it right right now. It don't matter if it was Adam, you, or the Pope, or Mary Matt, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter who it was. The only person who would have not done what Adam did was Jesus. You know what I'm saying? But God did it the way that he did it intentionally to glorify himself. To make his greatness known through mercy and compassion and grace. To leave us all in a position of humility. Because it was important that things should happen the way that they did. It wasn't an accident. It was by design. God knew that Adam was going to do what he did. We need to understand that. If God didn't want Adam to fall into sin... He wouldn't have said, don't eat this. You know what I mean? That was the plan. Jesus was crucified before the world was even founded. That was always the plan. That was always the plan. It wasn't like God created the heavens and the earth, and then we messed up, and then he's like, oh, man. Dang, I guess I'm going to have to send my son Jesus and kill him to fix this problem. No. That was the plan from the beginning. That was the plan. That was the plan. And it's important. It's important to understand <laughs> that what he did through Jesus Christ has made the way for us to have eternal life. We have to know that. We have to know that there's no other way to have eternal life except through Jesus Christ. You know, like the disciples knew that, and that was a revelation given to them. Peter, whenever Jesus said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, a lot of people didn't understand. He wasn't saying physically eat my flesh and drink my blood. He was speaking in spiritual terms. He was talking about the crucifixion. He was talking about the fact that you that we had to be made perfect by his blood. But when he's teaching these things, the, the, a lot of the disciples left. And Jesus looked at the 12, and he said, will you leave too? And they said, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus has the words of eternal life. There's no... We don't need to look for anything else. We need to look here. 
everything we need to know, Jesus spoke about it. He told us about it. He told us about it. And even though there's so much good promise to us, he lays it out. And he says in Matthew 16, 24 through 26, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He's saying in this world, there's going to be a temptation to live according to the world and live according to the draw of the world, to have these fancy things, to have this beautiful woman, to have this and to have that. And Jesus is saying, look, what's it matter if you gain all that stuff and then you die and you go to hell? You know what I mean? Like, we need to understand that the most important thing is for us to be able to die and not go to hell. <laughs> Is, is for us to be able to die and continue to live. We don't want to lose our soul because we're trying to gain these things and live in this world and have what this world has to offer, which what this world has to offer is really nothing because it can't give you eternal life, which is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. It's all that matters. Jesus says, this is eternal life, to know him, to know God and the one who God sent, Jesus Christ. You know, it's important to understand that God sent Jesus. So whenever there's a lot of movement in the world today, we're like, well, there's many paths to God, many paths to heaven. No, no. You have, Jesus is the only way. Because if you say that you can get there away besides Jesus, you're saying that God sent Jesus and crucified him for no reason. It's important to understand that that is extremely disrespectful. Imagine if you had a son and you sent him as a delegation to, to mediate and to speak on your behalf to some people. And those people said, oh, that's not his son. He didn't send him. How would that make you feel? It would make you upset. Especially if you had sent him with the terms <laughs> of your agreement of, of the relationship that you're setting. And you crucified him and sealed it in the blood. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we can't even fathom. You know, but it's important to understand that. That's the foundation that has to be laid too. Jesus is the only way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There is no other way. Jesus Christ is the only way. Because Jesus Christ is the only way that we have remission of sins. There is no other path that gives us remission of sins and a confidence that all our sins, all our debt has been paid and atoned for. Jesus is the only one who has provided us with that way. No other prophets that have spoken in the name of any other religion died for anyone's sins. You know what I mean? They probably died for their own sins. So Jesus is the only one who has made a way for us to enter into the temple. That's why the veil of the temple was torn in two. Through his death, when he was crucified, he made a way for us to have that direct relationship with the Father. He's our high priest, but we're all in this priesthood. We're all hearing from 
Christ, and God is speaking to him to speak to us. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to sanctify us and to prepare us for the day of his revelation. That's what I've been thinking about again, like, man, I remember growing up, and it was like all we talked about was Jesus coming back. And it's like I don't think we really talk about it anymore. I feel like it, you know, it's hard whenever you just life goes on, and it's like we get so busy. But we need to remember Jesus is coming back. You know what I mean? It's not like, like I feel like sometimes I'm just like, all right, I'm just kind of, I'm just, I'm just waiting to die. You know what I mean? Like, like that's how I feel sometimes. I'm like really, because I know that that's, you know, I've been convinced that death is the beginning of my life. And right now, I'm just kind of waiting for that. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to do what the Lord's called me to do in the meantime. You know? But it's really just to keep me busy until I really get to go be with him. But at the same time, there's this, this anticipation that we need to have of his revelation. Because we need to know that we can't get caught unaware you know we don't want to we don't want him to come back and us not be ready it's good to have this anticipation that Jesus is coming back and to have that in the back of our minds and in our mindset that we're going to be standing before him because we need to live our lives worthy of him we need to live our lives in reverence and awe of what he spoke so we don't get caught with our pants down you know what I mean That's the only way that I can think of to put it. (laughs) We don't want to be ashamed. You know? We want to be ready. And it's it's good to have this expectation that it could be at any moment. Because it keeps you on the edge. I mean, it keeps you keeping your guard up. You know what I mean? Jesus says, if you had known the day or the hour that the thief was coming... You wouldn't have let him come and steal your stuff. But he came when you didn't realize it. He said, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. It will come at an hour and a time when you do not expect it. I don't want to get caught unexpectedly. I don't want to be ashamed at all. I don't want to be ashamed at all. I don't. I want to be like anticipating it. There was a time when I thought that the Lord had come to take my life. I was in Leavenworth Prison and I was having a pity party and I was just depressed and thought I wanted to die. And I I had smoked some drug in there and I could feel my intestines shaking inside my stomach. And then I saw a great white light behind me. And I'll tell you what, I was terrified. I was terrified because I thought, oh my gosh, I am not ready to die. I thought I wanted to die, but I ain't ready to die. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not ready, you know? And, I, and then I was afraid. I'm like, Lord, okay, I'll get it right. You know what I mean? I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Like, here we go. Let's do it. You know what I mean? Like, I needed that. It's good to have that feeling because I don't know. I might have been hallucinating, but it was real to me. It was real enough. People that were in prison with me, they're like, man, I was talking to a guy, but I told him that story. He was like, that's what happened? Because you turned around like crazy. You know what I mean? I said, yeah, I thought God came to smoke me. I said, he said, man, I've given you all these things, and here you are having this pity party, and you're crying and acting like you want to die, and you're totally disrespecting all that I've given you. He said, you better get up, gird yourself like a man, get to work. Yeah, I went to work. <laughs> I tell you what, man, they couldn't, there wasn't a prisoner in that prison I didn't invite to church. I was going around, there wasn't a, hardly a service I didn't go to. I went to all of them. I went to the Messianic Jewish ones. Messianic Christian ones, I went to the Islamic ones, I went to, I went to all of them. 
I went to all of them. I went to the Mormon ones. Those guys are messed up. I'm just going to tell you. I'm sorry. They, they're preaching another gospel. I'm just going to put that out there. And, uh, but, man, I'll tell you what. I was going to all of them because I would, I'd be going and I'd invite somebody to church. And they'd be like, well, I'll do this. I'd be like, okay. One, a lot of the Catholic guys, oh, I, don't, I can't go to church with you. I'm Catholic. Okay, okay. I started going to Catholic church. No, I'm going to that one too. Let's go. You know? So, and I did. And I studied. And I used my time wisely. And I realized that even in this place, in prison, I, was, I found more joy in prison than I had ever found in my entire life. Because I loved God. And I knew that he loved me. And he had mercy on me. And he spared me from death. And he's a good father. And he had brought me to that place because that's just the place that I had to be. You know? I mean, I don't, you don't have to be there. You know, I had to be there because I wouldn't listen to anybody else. I was expecting God to speak to me from heaven. I wasn't looking at the word. Even though I had studied the word, I had, I had known the word a lot, actually, which was crazy. That's a whole other story altogether. But, but I wasn't believing it. You know what I mean? Like Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? I wasn't doing what he said. You know what I mean? I was just still doing my own thing. I was still doing what Eric wanted to do. I hadn't completely surrendered my life and taken up my cross and followed Jesus. And it was crazy because it's like I didn't want to give up my life, even though my life was terrible, a mess, because I'm an idiot. I didn't want to give up control. I didn't want to give up control of my own life, even though my control led me to, to bad places and terrible decision making. I still wanted to be in control. But when I finally surrendered to the Lord, I said, look, okay, I, I surrender. I had to surrender. You know what I mean? And I don't know how to get people there. But all I know is whoever loves his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life shall save it. And now I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm living for him. And I love him. You know what I mean? Because he's good. He really is good. Everything that I believed about God was not true. I thought that he was just picking on me. I thought he didn't like me. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, no, I've shown you what to do. You're suffering these consequences because you keep ignoring and rejecting me. And you keep doing your own thing. Our tendency is to turn to the Lord when we're suffering the consequences that he's allowed us to suffer because of our own choices, because of our rejecting and ignoring him. And then when we're still having to suffer those consequences, we don't think that God is hearing us. But he's just allowing us to, to endure the consequences so that we don't make the same mistake again. It's like if you have a kid that keeps going to jail and you keep bailing him out, he's going to keep going to jail until you let him sit there for a little while sometime. You know? God doesn't bail us out of all our circumstances. He allows us to endure the pressure that we get ourselves in to train us and to teach us not to make the same mistakes again. It isn't because he's, that he, he doesn't like us or he hates us. It's because he loves us that he chastens us. It's because he loves us that he disciplines us. In, in Proverbs it says, Discipline your son while there is still hope, and let not your soul spare for as much crying. You know, I keep thinking that whenever Jeremiah's crying and bawling, and I'm like, and I'm not, you know, disciplining him yet, spanking, not too much at least. But, but, I, but I think about that, like, even though he's crying and he's weeping and he doesn't, I, I hope that he understands. I try to help him to understand everything I'm doing and everything I'm telling you is for your good. You know what I mean? Everything that God is telling us and Jesus is saying and telling us not to do, it's not because 
they're trying to keep us from having fun. It's because they're trying to spare us from death. They're trying to spare us from hopelessness and sorrow and pain and all the things that we reap from sowing to the flesh. It's not like, it says, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Like God is, he's into pleasure. I mean, shoot, look at it from the beginning. He set Adam and Eve in the garden naked. And all he said was have sex. You know what I mean? Be fruitful and multiply. You know what I mean? I'm just saying like, he, but he, everything has to be putting him first. Whatever he's given us to enjoy. And under his guidelines. Under his restrictions. We have to put him first. You know? We have to obey. And we'll, we'll go more into all the things that he, that he taught. But I wanted to just say, Luke twenty two forty two. I'm going to end with this. Jesus goes and he's praying and he says, Father, if you're willing, please remove this cup from me. He says, nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. And in Hebrews 5, 7, and 8, it says, Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and he was heard that he feared, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And it's important to see that even Jesus suffered in the flesh to learn obedience. He set an example of how we are to walk in that same path. And he showed us also that it is better to be crucified on this cross for the Father's will and glory than to not do the Father's will and go to hell. It's better to be crucified in this life and do God's will than it is to do your own thing and end up in hell. Because even that terrible of a death, being crucified and humiliated, is nothing compared to going to hell. That's how important it was to set that example, for us to understand how terrible of a place hell is. Jesus was crucified, and that was nothing. That was worth it to do the Father's will, to lay down your life. And he was able to lay down his life. It says that he feared. We Sometimes there's going to be a cross. There's going to be things that God's telling us to let go of, things that we know in ourselves that we have to stop doing because we're living in rebellion against God. And the only way that we're going to take up that cross and be crucified is if we have a healthy fear of not doing the Father's will, of living in rebellion against Him. It's good to have that healthy fear that says, I have to do what God tells me to do. I don't have a choice. I don't have my, my will has to be surrendered to His will. And even though He's requiring that of us, He's giving us so much more. We can't even fathom. It says no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen what God has prepared for those who wait for them, for him. And we're waiting for him. And to suffer a little bit in this life, denying ourselves and taking up our cross, to walk in obedience to a loving God, it doesn't even compare. It says these, these temporal sufferings... Are, are, can't even be compared. There's no scale. It's not even worth comparing them. These temporary sufferings don't even, are not even worth trying to weigh to the far exceeding weight of glory that is coming to us. To be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. So let's make sure that we know. First, Jesus is the only way. Second, everything Jesus said is how we are required to live. You know, he lays it out. I mean, he, the, simple, the simplest way to say it is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. And he's calling us to do those things and to die to this world, to not be captive to it. When you're born again, you can't be. You can't be enslaved to this world any longer. He sets us free from it. My whole mind, I can't even understand how I used to think compared to how I think now. It just, it blows my mind to think the path that I was on and how God spared me. And I'm just like, how did I, I was just so blind, you know? So, so I'm going to pray. And, and if there's anyone here, I don't know if anybody wants to, were we going to do some prayer over here? Eric, you want to, Eric and maybe Sue, if you can come over there. And if anybody needs prayer today, I'm going to pray for a second, but if you need prayer, just come over here and get some prayer from Sue or, or if there's anybody else that would go over there and pray and um, just pray for people as needed. And let's just pray. Let's just, let's just set our hearts to understand what's been given to us. Understand. I feel like we're, we've come a long way in the church, right? But, so, you know, I feel like we need to get back to the foundation that was laid. we got to get back to making sure we understand the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That faith in him is the only way you're going to make it. It's not about anything you can do. It's about just believing in what's already been done for you. And when you put your faith in him, he's going to enable you to obey him. He gives us the spirit to enable us to walk in his ways. It's not about us. Like Paul says, in me and my flesh dwells no good thing. We're just looking to him. It's not to be discouraged and beat down about all our sins. It's, we can have freedom to, to know that no matter how many times we fall short, all of our sins have been forgiven and forgotten by God in Jesus Christ. We just need to keep coming to him. He's going to fix us. We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. He's going to form us and fashion us into the image of his son. And all we have to do is keep showing up in faith of what's been done for us through Jesus. And I'll just pray, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. I just thank you. Thank you for Jesus. We just thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, given us hope. Give us understanding, Lord, so that we can live. Open our eyes. Soften our hearts. Let us be ready. Let us be ready for that day and that hour that's coming upon the whole earth. Help us to never be ashamed by your presence. Help us to never fear your coming, but to rejoice in it, to look forward to it. Help us to live for you. Lord, we just ask that you would just stir us up. It says in your, you say, in your light, we see light. Lord, let your light shine upon us. Give us revelation. Give us understanding. Give us fervor and zeal to do your work. To proclaim the gospel, the good news of your son Jesus, who you gave for all and appointed over all as Lord. We just pray for this church that you would just continue to raise up workers. Help us to be faithful with what you've given. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I said praise the Lord. <clears throat>